Evening all, welcome to another King's Cross Show radio show. It's about ten past nine, Tuesday night. So we're going to carry on looking at the best of the best chess games, according to ChessGames.com. So this is the 1960s, and uh, yeah, we didn't go in total strict order, but we're back in the 1960s, part four or five. So there's two key games to have a look at tonight and the first one is one of my favorite games of this metanov this actually um, got me very excited to explore his other games actually uh, this, is, this wasn't such a, a well-known player when I did a video on my my channel um, well as far as YouTube is concerned there weren't that many people doing videos on this metanov but his dynamic sacrificial style is a real crowd pleaser and in fact uh, my good friend uh, Jessica Fisher Queen on YouTube also did a great documentary series which I recommend you check out it's really good documentary uh, so this is a really interesting player uh, who was also a checkers champion I think he shares that with um, Ivanchuk he was brilliant at checkers as well drafts as that's known so um, but he wasn't uh, allowed to play that much in international tournaments so he never got the GM title anyway so this is his game against uh, Chernikov uh, so I am was his um, title eventually so there's better not playing white against Oleg like Chernikov in Rostov 1962 so uh, we have here a Sicilian defense let's add a Kibitza. and also check out light book as well so knight f3, we have knight c6, and Nesmetinov actually has played bishop b5 uh, quite a lot, actually, I believe, in this position, relatively uh, a lot. And in fact, uh, sort of lines became, became known after him and Rosalimo uh, if, for bishop b5, but in this game, he actually chose d4, open Sicilian, and uh, black took, yes. And then an accelerated dragon, which does allow c4 actually. Uh, a lot of opening references talk about c4 here because black hasn't challenged it's the main move in, in live book actually because black hasn't challenged this pawn that is possible here and it's the most popular move to get that kind of Maroxy bind. But actually, he just transposes it back, he just ignored that move order. Knight c3. Yeah, because usually uh, here, um, knight f6 to try and encourage knight c3 first. Okay, little finesse there. So anyway, knight c3 bypassing Maroxy binds. Bishop g7, bishop e3, knight f6, and then bishop c4 is played here. Uh, now black castled and possibly there's a threat here of knight takes e4 if white is too casual I believe this might actually be an annoyance for white if white castled this didn't happen in the game knight takes e4 and with the later d5 probably blacks fine there Okay, so the bishop actually dropped back here, which kind of indirectly parries that threat. It's extinguished. Now we have knight g4, and the idea is to put it's putting pressure on d4 here, unveiling that pressure on d4. And uh, the idea is the queen takes to take on d4. Now instead of queen takes g4, if knight takes c3, this is better for black. Knight takes e3. Knight takes d8. This ends up being better for black. This position here. Because actually black can insert bishop takes c3 damaging the pawns. Yeah, quite a lot of simplification. That would be a, a relatively dull game from what we're about to see. So, But black is better there. Uh, there's no point doing knight takes c6. So we have queen takes g4. 
and our knight takes d4 and yeah it seems in this position uh, the main move is actually dropping the queen back to d1 this is the main move uh, in live book it seems and for example game continuation could be like this with bishop d4 trying to get rid of black's bishop pair uh, and this is okay this is quite comfortable for white in fact this position here is comfortable so that that does seem a viable viable idea it's not so passive as you might think it's kind of it's kind of pseudo aggressive actually because it's it's it means this bishop d4 is to extinguish that bishop to weaken the square so it's kind of aggressive in a way this retreat uh yeah, so that, that's probably why that is the main move here, just to drop the queen back to d1. But we see a more ambitious move, queen h4, but it has a certain downside that maybe black thought this is, if he wants to draw, he could just get a draw here um, by harassing potentially the queen. Not immediately, but after this next move, queen a5, uh, this is representing... Uh, a very big threat. It's knight takes b3 and bishop takes c3 if, if white's not careful. If white doesn't uh, do something about that, uh, then that would be terrible. And if white castles queenside here, again, this is uh, fine for black. In fact, black might even be able to do this. Yeah, this this is dangerous. Uh, <clears throat> it's not so pleasant for White in that position anyway. So White castles queenside. There's a lot of castles, not queenside. White castles kingside, and we see this bishop f6, and maybe there's the thought of just having a repetition draw with the queen on a5. There's no bishop g5 here. And probably the idea was uh, that uh, what, what is the queen actually doing here on h4? Is it kind of misplaced? Uh, because if actually the queen goes to g3 here, there is a tactic. Can you can you spot? Sorry, I shouldn't really. I'll, I'll let you try and work out what would be. Uh, this seems to be parking the queen for an attack, but it's kind of basically refuted. If this was the game continuation, it's it's refutable. Black to play here. What would you play in this position? There's a tactic which is very unpleasant and would leave white with no attack whatsoever. Can you see? What would you play with black in this position? I'll give you 20 seconds because it's streaming. Bigger delay than usual. If you want to call out your... Uh, Black has has a resource here, slightly subtle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because this folk, it only needs this knight not to be there, and bang. And this just leaves white with absolutely nothing compared to the game continuation. So this is why if queen g3 is not possible here. Uh, queen f4 suffers the same thing, by the way. It, it looks another forking square. It's, exa it's suffering exactly the same way. So there's still queen takes c3 here. That's better for black. You know, check. Let's just take on f4 instead. Horrible for white. So actually, this continuation uh, looks like uh, it's not a big deal. And if queen g4, that runs into a deep on move like d6 it doesn't seem at all good but maybe this is actually okay for white to just go back but if white wants to go back he should have done that earlier um ideally so anyway but there was a specific idea and here black play bishop g7 and just continue harassing because f4 is out of the question because of queen c3 uh, and if queen h4 Again, we just go to f6. So maybe uh, Chernikov thought, okay, 
I'll just have a draw of black and uh, try and win with white in the next round. However, there's a big shock because actually on move 11 after bishop f6, something else occurred here in this Metanov's mind. <laughs> and it, yeah, it puts him on the map for me to study as a player. And in fact, I found out later, yeah, a lot, you know, that, that he's he has created many brilliant uh, games. Uh, so, guess guess what is the iconic move in this position? Uh, so, white play. So we've seen why Queen G3 and Queen F4 aren't particularly glamorous. Queen H6 is not particularly glamorous either because of Bishop G7. <laughs> so what to play here? Oh, some of you might not have seen this game. <laughs> yeah, he, he did a sort of positional queen sack. Queen takes f6. And that was the name of my video, if you want to check it out a few years back. Positional queen sacrifice. It's for... Uh, uh, it seems as though... It's just for two pieces at the moment. If uh, the, if pawn takes two pieces here, though, uh, my Houdini six, which I purchased recently, thinks white is better here already. It's just or at least equal, at least equal, slightly better or at least equal. Even just two pieces in this position. If this did happen, because if we look at this, actually. That there are some uh, subtle positional factors and tactical factors blended in. Uh, there's weakened dark squares. There's a bishop without a counterpart, a dark square bishop without a counterpart, striking into those dark squares. And there's a good square on d5, which has no adjacent pawns to kick away an outpost on d5, which makes a fine thing for the knight. So this is actually already, it will be tricky uh, for black this position. Now black maybe didn't like the look of that entirely and wanted to try and get a better version of that and flung in knight e2 check first to at least take away this knight from that d5 square now if king h1 if this was ignored then e takes knight takes this is actually a big improvement for black on the game continuation uh, for example, b5. Uh, this this is actually quite nice for black. As long as that d5 isn't a major outpost, black's doing great here. But uh, after knight e2 check, actually, yeah, the best move uh, is is to actually take and accept a delay if d5 is headed back to. So e takes. We have this little delay. So black one. I move there a tempo so the knight's coming back so there's still this idea though of playing knight d5 and bishop d4 to target f6 and the black king in general now we see uh, rook e8 knight d5 and rook e6 defending f6 bishop d4 so this is quite an interesting position because is is there really enough for the queen the the pieces seem to be quite enjoying themselves in the absence of the white queen remarkably so uh, perhaps you can argue uh, but okay what happens king g7 it seems as though f6 is pretty solid here rook ad1 now this has a subtle little idea that actually in this position one of the subtle features white has here which well I guess blacks use as well is, is the idea of a rook lift but here for white white has rook d3 now with potential ideas of rook f3 
coming up or knight takes and then rook f3 so that f6 is still a kind of target we see d6 and now rook d3 bishop d7 and just just targeting f6 yeah rook f3 is played we see bishop b5 here and now the bishop drops back to hit the queen queen d8 and now if the rook moved say the rook moved then this position is uh okay for black actually black will be wanting to play something like bishop c4 especially bishop c4 or rook takes c3 uh but here yeah there's another bit of ingenuity in this position white took on f6 first okay now if rook takes f6 this wasn't played if rook takes f6 it's uh <laughs> kind of interesting actually that in this position there's a move which appears to be immensely strong um i wonder if if uh, anyone can guess well actually i i think it's a, it's a bit hard going actually i I'm, I'm i'm forget the guessing game it's rook d1 uh yeah this this is actually really tricky for black this position with that pin uh, for example, if bishop e2, bishop takes f6, here. Yeah. This is just ending up better for white. If white gets the material back. Okay, so um, this, so that is a tricky position. The simple rook d1 is simple and strong actually. It's if if king g8. Let's have a look at king g8. Rook takes f6. And now rook takes f7 would be very strong. And if bishop e8, e5. That's another point of that rook there. This just ends up being overwhelming actually. This position for white. The other rook can come in. <laughs> and. Yeah, it's just actually really, really strong with the two bishops and the two rooks here. So yeah, that's a really interesting move. Knight takes f6 with that massive pin, which needed to be calculated. So that seems to be actually one interesting thing about this method of if there's a pin, pins make tactics and can can make tactics enormously deep, not just what you think, but there's an immobility being exploited in that variation which maybe had had been seen quite a bit by this method of just having that pin is crushing um, but anyway uh, we have Bishop e2 being played here which allows a discovered check Knight takes h7 check now if King takes then actually not Rook h3 checks then there's Bishop h5 and the White's attack but actually, rook takes f7 is strong here. At least the rook's been won. And, that, and white's still got a raging attack here with things like the check and then bishop f6. It's a raging attack. Uh, so actually, we see king g8. But now rook h3 with ideas like knight g5 just to mate on h8. So this attack needs to be extinguished somehow before it's too late. Black tries to stop this bishop on the diagonal. F4, bishop takes, king takes. But this is very, very dangerous now. Look at these two bishops, this knight and rook. They're actually pretty menacing in this position. And they feed on these dark square weaknesses around the king. Which we've seen in actually many of the iconic games, they feature this idea that there's a lot of fun, enormous amount of fun to be had when there's 
dark square weaknesses around the opponent's king the absence of a fin chateau bishop but here it's enormous fun yeah so we have rook c8 as if to try and extinguish at least this bishop with an exchange sack but that's avoided bishop d4 just quietly avoided yeah now you might ask well okay rook, rook takes e4 that runs into knight f6 that's the problem that runs into knight f6 all the time uh black tries b5 now we have knight g5 now we really have pinned that now because otherwise it'll be mates if that rook moves rook c7 but now here is a gorgeous little combination coming up which is a bit like <laughs> i'll give you a clue it's a bit like one of petrosian's finishes against basky we might have seen recently uh it's using the same sort of tactical motif part part of the tactical stuff you might have seen if you remember petrosian against basky recently so um let, let's see White's play. So, what would you play here with white? Okay, uh, actually, th there's at least a couple of very, very strong moves here. Uh, one of them was chosen, which might not be technically the strongest. Bishop takes f7 was chosen, but also it seems bishop takes e5 with is very strong as well. Uh, for example, here, bishop takes, and if rook takes, we have rook h8 check. And that's winning for white because otherwise there'll be uh, if the king took is uh, running into that horrible fork. But uh, yeah, this this is also pretty strong. That's that probably is the strongest move. Bishop takes uh, f7 because actually here you know if king g7 doesn't matter where the king goes, there's a fork on e6 potentially, which is good good enough to win. Uh, but also there's even this because it ends up with a fork on e6 still in the end of this leaving white bishop up so anyway yeah so it's absolutely winning this bishop takes e5 but this is also strong bishop takes f7 rook takes and the same kind of idea rook h8 check now if king g7 then rook takes d8 is simple and strong uh, that's just two pieces up well it's going to be a piece up sorry after taking the rook but uh, in the game yeah we have king takes and this is two pieces for the rook now which is winning still and also white is a pawn up as well now black resigned here yeah he did resign here didn't want to play this on let's say he moved the pawn and we kick the rook this this is going to be a technique win basically so anyway uh, black resign there and um, yeah so that was a positional queen sacrifice which caught my imagination so if you want to see the, uh, the video I did quite some time back now yeah if you check that out there's best of positional queen sacrifice so uh okay let's go on to another game now i'd like to show you um uh, okay so this is from the 60s as well botvnik against portish in 1968 
Okay, so this is in the Monte Carlo uh, tournament. So 1968, October the 4th, 1968. C4, the English opening. E5 from Portish. Knight C3, Knight F6. G3. D5, so it's like a reverse Sicilian, this line. C takes, Knight takes. Bishop G2, Bishop E6. Knight f3, knight c6, and the English opening is very, very popular nowadays at the super GM level. But uh, Botvinnik was playing it, you know, way back then. Uh, so <laughs> White castles, knight b6. We have d3 now. It's actually considered the main move according to Chess Base Live Book. D3 or rook b1 is popular, but d3 is the absolute main move. Bishop e7. A3. Yeah, this is also a very, very popular plan, uh, potentially with B4. So it, it's literally like playing a Sicilian defense in reverse. A bit of a cross between a dragon and an Eidolf, but that plan with black with B5, B4, and a Sicilian is being used basically here to basically put pressure potentially on the E5 pawn. So it's, it's a great idea in the Sicilian defense, and this is a kind of reverse Sicilian so black tries to put the brakes on b4 by playing a5 so we have bishop e3 now bishop e3 is very interesting as well uh, it actually provides the opportunity to play d4 it does support d4 now black ignored that possibility black just castle d4 is possible but there's also an idea of just using this outpost square. That is an ideal outpost square on this semi open file. Knight a4 was played, trying to like potentially double the pawns or just use the outpost square to win the dark squared bishop. Now, black took this, queen takes a4, bishop d5. Now, we could say that black's play so far seems very sensible. Nevertheless, white does have a nice edge in this position. And actually, you know, the English opening is also popular with Magnus Carlsen. He, he, he loves playing the English opening on many an many occasion. And this is just a nice edge here after rook fc1. We have this kind of Sicilian c file pressure in reverse. Rook e8. And white simply doubles for the moment. He just has this easy plan it seems just double the rooks rook c2 bishop blocks back rook a c1 just double the rooks now with the doubling the intensifying of pressure on c6 it does seem here queen b5 is actually a big threat now because if any ever any b6 we just snap on c6 of course uh so black's got to be kind of wary about Queen b5. Let's say black ignores queen b5 and tries uh, for rook b8. This, this might actually be. Uh, it's not completely losing, should we say? Knight d2. It might. It might be okay uh, to play actually. It's not completely losing, but in the game, maybe black was irritated with this kind of position, where white has the pressure. And black's just a little bit passive, and maybe he was irritated. He wanted to try and neutralize, try and neutralize the C file, so he actually uh, retreated the knight with the idea, perhaps, of setting up a blockade on the C file with C6 to sort of stymie. I think that's the right word. These rooks he wanted to stymie the rooks with knight B8 and C6, and also setting maybe what he thought was a trap. Because isn't that C pawn able to be taken? Well, it is. Has the trap been set? Well, this is literally like a trap mechanism in the wider sense of the word trap. Because it looks as though, hold on a sec, <laughs> the, the trap's been closed, hitting the queen. Ah! Is this a tactical blunder? Did, did Bopnik just wreck his whole position? White play here. 
So what would you play with white? Well, your rook's trapped, so that does limit options, actually. It's it's not the hardest white to play I've given, because uh, the, the thing is, the rook is, is potentially trapped, right? So you've got to do something about that. But which way? Which way do you rescue the rook on c7? Your poor rook on c7 has been trapped. How would you rescue the rook? Actually, remember the queen is attacked here as well, by the way. There's two threats, primary, secondary. If you play bishop b6, black uh, would just take the queen. Yeah. So not bishop b6. Now I have to ask you which rook this is of crucial importance if you do want the rook to take the bishop on c6 which rook this one or this one if you did want to snap off that bishop Okay, now if you took with this rook, actually white is still okay here, but this isn't as fantastic actually as the other continuation. White's still okay here, uh, according to engine here. White's at least equal, by the way, for the exchange tag. But there was a fantastic idea about to be unveiled here, because white actually took with this one apparently leaving this rook still stranded yeah now if knight takes then rook takes b7 is adequate by the way is adequate as well so black uh, took with the, the b pawn and again here you could play rook b7 and white is actually better technically but there's something much much stronger in this position something much much stronger so white play here now my clue to you is i've started using this this year diagonal of death that's my clue to you, Diagonal of Death. <laughs> and also Bishop without a counterpart. There's a Bishop without a counterpart in this position. This should automatically imply to you, automatically, that Bishop is without a counterpart. That Black, there's a counterpart here, they're in balance, like a mathematical equation. But White potentially has superiority on light square tactical operations because of that Bishop without a counterpart. That should trigger as well uh, some alarm bells. But, yeah, black, yeah, might be potentially weak on light squares, that's a clue. Okay, he plays the amazing, well, I don't know if you get this. <laughs> Rook takes f7. Now, this is the diagonal of death, and this is the bishop without the counterpart, yeah? So, Rook takes f7. Wow. So, what if king takes... This didn't happen, but check would drag the king out here. Because if rook e6, we have probably strongest is actually knight takes e5 check. And if here we have, th this is mega strong, for example. We're going to actually try and just mate the king. 
so you can see all sorts of things happen which are pretty nasty here if king f6 we just uh, win the queen for, for a start and if king g6 this this is nasty queen e4 check knight g5 going on to that diagonal of death and if king here we have that classic mating thing smothered mate with uh boy i'll just mate so um yeah it's too dangerous to take that rook here far too dangerous because of this queen c4 check there's really nothing here for black uh, so that's ignored that rook takes f7 black plays h6 to try and take away that g5 square now the rook does move to b7 it's done a little bit of damage there's only two pawns around the king now and black is even weaker on the light squares this bishop is without a counterpart black's even weaker on these light squares and this is what creates fun this kind of exaggeration of existing weaknesses creates a lot of fun in many of these iconic games really uh, so white is very strong on the light squares uh, we have queen c8 queen c4 check king h8 and now the rook is attacked on b7 guess what white plays remember white's very very strong on the light squares So what would you play with white? White's play. this yeah white's immensely strong on the light squares down and yeah he could do a sort of normal move like rook f7 white's still massively up after rook f7 by the way uh with knight h4 in mind but actually knight h4 was placed straight off the bat just leaving the rook because this knight g6 is a big issue and g5 doesn't help it just open up the rook by the way here so that would actually be checkmate checkmate uh so the rook was taken but now knight g6 check and this bishop without a counterpart is unveiled here the bishop without a counterpart striking with bishop e4 vicious you have four of black's pawns on dark squares the corresponding light square weaknesses are just horrible this this light square bishop is enormous here we have bishop d6 knight takes e5 check g6 bishop takes g6 check king g7 and now the final crushing blow can you see the final crushing move white play here what would you play with white in fact even just taking the rook is really strong this wasn't played but even taking the rooks really strong because if it takes this this is just crushing uh hitting and, and threatening all sorts so even that strong but actually in the game give yourself some points for the game continuation which is brilliant as well bishop takes h6 check yeah black resigned here if king takes 
we have check check and we can just take the queen even but maybe even stronger is to kick the king about a bit first but we can basically take the queen after yeah uh, so black resign here if we look at another possibility king h8 then there's check and if here it's carnage knight takes d6 check check it's just carnage knight takes b7 yeah. so black yeah didn't want to play on after bishop takes h6 check now um yeah i hope you enjoyed these two games these games really show how basically i think in both games it shows how weaknesses around the king and bishops without counterparts as well they can be exacerbated in in the there's Metanov game rather brilliantly with the queen sack there were dark square weaknesses and here there were light square weaknesses in this game to exploit with that light square bishop lurking around so the magic of tactics old old emphasize is often linked with the abstract idea of you know weaknesses on a certain color complex like dark squares or light squares it's that starts off the recipe for disaster and the tactics delivers the recipe so the conditions f for these disasters yeah it's the weaknesses that were created but sacrificially uh, the implementations here this game and the previous game absolutely stunning implementations for how those weaknesses are actually exploited okay i hope you got something from that uh and have a good week uh remember to like up the video if you like it and uh see you next week and check out my two uh more de uh, detailed analysis uh dedicated to these two games um i've annotated both of them in the past so check out the king's cross channel on that thanks very much cheers then